Beginning in 2018, every 10% or more U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation, or CFC, must include in his, her, or its income his share of aggregate income of all his CFCs in excess of an aggregate return on assets of 10%. This series of advanced level videos explains these hard rules using fairly simple language. Here's what the videos will cover. U.S. international tax rules underwent a sea change about a year ago in December 2017. International tax practitioners must rethink strategies and planning because of three brand new code sections. One of these is section 951 cap A. Let's start with a super simple example of what 951 cap A does. Joe owns 15% of a controlled foreign corporation or CFC. The CFC earns $1 million of profits in 2018 and has no subpart F income. It has tangible depreciable assets of $4 million, 10% of which is $400,000. Joe must include in his income 15% of $600,000, that is, 15% of the excess of the million profit over 10% of tangible depreciable assets. Joe's inclusion is $90,000 and it's all ordinary income. 951 Cap A applies to U.S. owners of CFCs, whether the owners are individuals, corporations, estates, or taxable trusts. For corporations, though, two other brand new sections have an even more radical impact. Beginning in 2018, regular or C corporations get three special deductions. First, there's a deduction under Section 245 Cap A for 100% of dividends they receive from foreign corporations of which they own 10% or more. Thus, foreign subsidiary dividends are tax-free to U.S. corporations. 951 Cap A and Subpart F mitigate the effect of this, requiring current inclusion of part of the profits of those foreign subsidiaries. Second, C corporations get a deduction under Section 250 for half the inclusion under 951 Cap A. Individuals don't get this deduction. Finally, C corporations also get a deduction under Section 250 for part of their profits on sales or services to foreign customers. See my video on Section 250. 951 Cap A requires that a U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation, or CFC, must include in his income his share of the CFC's income in excess of 10% return on assets. All this is computed on an aggregate basis by each such shareholder. It applies to individuals, corporations, trusts, and estates. The inclusions flow through partnerships and S-corporations. Let's start with a review of some key terms. For more details on these, watch my video on subpart F definitions. A U.S. shareholder is any U.S. person who owns 10% or more of a foreign corporation. U.S. person can include a partnership organized under U.S. law. A foreign corporation is any business entity organized outside the USA that is treated for U.S. tax purposes as a corporation. Thus, corporation does not include an entity that has elected flow-through treatment. For those, see my video on disregarded entities. A controlled foreign corporation, or CFC, 
is any such foreign corporation that is more than 50% owned by U.S. shareholders at any time during its tax year. I'll use this basic structure in examples in these videos. Joe and Sally are U.S. individuals, and Big C is a C corporation organized in Delaware. None of them are related. The two foreign Bergs corporations operate hamburger restaurants in their countries of incorporation. Ownership percentages are determined with attribution rules. Attribution includes husband and wife, parent and child, a corporation and its shareholders, and a partnership and its partners. Each shareholder must compute his own 951 Cap A inclusion. Some of the computations are done at the CFC level. Gross income, deductions, and net assets must be calculated for each CFC. These amounts for a particular CFC are then allocated among the shareholders based on each shareholder's share of income. Where there's only one class of stock, this is easy. But if the CFC has more than one class of stock, the allocations can get tricky. All of the determinations are made under U.S. tax principles. So the first step is adjust financial information much as if you were preparing a U.S. corporation income tax return. Then translate everything to dollars. The next step is determine gross income. Some types of income are excluded. Then allocate and apportion deductions among and reduce gross income to arrive at 951 Cap A income. Then determine the U.S. tax basis of assets. Take 10% of this. This 10% amount is reduced by net interest expense. Finally, allocate the net 951 Cap A income and 10% amount to the shareholders. Simple, huh? Not. Certain types of gross income and related expenses are excluded from the calculation of net 951 Cap A income. These include, first, subpart F income. It's separately included by the shareholders, so that this exclusion from income for 951 Cap A helps prevent double counting of the same income. Second, income that was excluded from subpart F income because it's subject to foreign income tax of more than 18.9%. This does not mean exclude all high tax income from 951 Cap A. No, this exclusion only applies if the income would otherwise be subpart F income. Thus, high tax income can be includable under 951 Cap A. Next, income from a U.S. trade or business of the CFC. Hopefully, your clients don't have any of this. It's bad news all by itself. Then, dividends the CFC receives from a related person, whether or not the related person is a CFC. Related person here has the same meaning as under subpart F. And finally, foreign oil or gas income. I really want to stress that 951 Cap A can apply to income subject to a high rate of foreign tax. The inclusion is not limited to low tax income. After you've determined gross income, you must allocate and apportion deductions to arrive at net income for 951 Cap A. The rules for allocating and apportioning deductions among categories of gross income for 951 Cap A are the rules as modified by subpart F. They're similar to the regular allocation and apportionment rules under the 861 regulations, but with notable differences. Deductions include taxes. Like 861, deductions are first allocated to income to which they directly relate. Deductions may directly relate to a type of gross income that is both included and excluded. Deductions not directly allocated to either included or excluded income are then apportioned. 
However, certain types of deductions must be apportioned in every case. Research expense is always apportioned among all types of gross income. Interest expense is first partly allocated, then what is not allocated is apportioned. If the interest is paid to a U.S. shareholder or a related CFC, it is first allocated to passive foreign personal holding company income, a type of subpart F income. Certain tracing rules apply. The balance of interest expense is apportioned based on assets using the regular 861 rules. A particular U.S. shareholder can elect for all of his CFC holdings to apportion this balance of interest for a particular year based on gross income, assuming such an election is still valid after the 2017 law changes. The allocation and apportionment rules are among the most complex parts of U.S. tax law. I haven't been able to figure out how to explain them in videos. See Regulation Sections 1.861-8 and following. The AICPA at one time published a textbook that explained them fairly well, but it's out of print and hard to find. Kuntz and Peroni's treatise basically ignores these rules. In the next video, I'll talk about calculating the 10% return on assets, determining pro rata share, and aggregation by the U.S. shareholder. If you found this useful, be sure to subscribe and watch the other videos on the International Tax Channel.